so important why is it that comes to that and that's better. Thank you, Bank. Thank you. Well, my financial interests are that I actually developed the Artemis, but I'm also a consultant for the company that was responsible for slightly killing the Artemis. So I have a, a very interesting position here. So <clears throat> I'm going to go over what the state of affairs was when this technology first came to market in 2000 in the epithelium, in the stromal component of the cornea, in the anterior chamber, and in the posterior chamber. So the epithelium, you've, many of you have seen me lecture on this, but using epithelial th thickness maps to screen for keratoconus leads to an increase in volume of LASIK in clinics. So you know how much it costs to bring a patient in through the door from a marketing standpoint, and losing that patient because the topography is equivocal and you don't want to take a risk uh, is a shame. You can positively increase the confidence in operating on someone who has equivocal topography, and our volumes over the last 10 years have been 7% higher all year on year because we are using epithelial thickness mapping. So that's one a very important application. Another very important application in my practice is the use of epithelial mapping for uh, high hyperopic treatments. And I've just published our two-year outcomes on 780 plus eyes uh, with 0.4 loss of two lines. And that's because rather than using keratometry as a measure of to how much steepening you can do, we use epithelial thickness mapping, much, much more physiological and accurate. Of course, there's the fixing of complications, and I've published many papers on this. Uh, you know it's not a big subject, but it's a very big interest if you have a problem with a patient. And then the intrastromal, of course, uh, this is where ultrasound has the big advantage because the peak-to-peak -peak measurement is so accurate that it could detect a flap even 10 years after LASIK, and it can actually map the flap with one micron precision over an 8 to 10 millimeter range. And this is very helpful uh, in certain circumstances. For example, in the case of an enhancement, you can see where the thinnest point is, or in a topography-guided treatment, you can pick the residual stromal thickness and determine whether you're able to do that topography-guided treatment under the flap, for example. Here's a flap. 10 years post-op, you can see very clearly identifying thick flaps is very important. In SMILE, it's very important to be able to measure things accurately because once the epithelium changes after the myopic SMILE, it's very important to be able to calculate whether the Visumax can make a flap safely to miss the epithelium and miss the interface given the imprecision of the Visumax itself. So we use it a lot for enhancements. And of course, then there's all the esoteric stuff like re Re repositioning a malrotated free cap or epithelial ingrowth analysis before surgery or treating uh, apical scar syndrome and all those complications which are nightmares. Anterior chamber, of course, well, it goes without saying, you can measure anything you want in the anterior chamber. Um, and in glaucoma, we're able to resolve Schlem's canal uh, and we're also able to do, use tissue characterization techniques to measure uveal scleral outflow. So that's not something that's been uh, explored in my practice at all, but uh, Jack Coleman and Cornell uh, and Columbia now, of course, have a lot of work in that. But the real USP for ultrasound, of course, is the posterior chamber. And the fact that we can identify the zonular plane, the sulcus plane, and measure things to and from there is unique. There's no extrapolation, it's a direct measurement. You can see that, and you know that you can have the same white to white in the same patient and still end up with oversizing and undersizing of lenses, uh, of ICLs, for no reason. And this is really one of the main, main applications. So with all of this possible in the year 2000, that's 17 years ago, why didn't this technology take off? I don't know. So uh, that's the end of my talk. No, no, that isn't there. I'm going to tell you some more. Okay, so basically what happened was that uh, the company that tried to commercialize this from our Cornell patents was called Ultralink. And they built a device which was unreliable, had a lot of unsatisfied customers. The company wasn't really able to keep up with servicing or improvements in the engineering. Exam time was long, the water bath, people were complaining about it. And simultaneously, the erstwhile uh, future promise of the Visante, which took three, it was promised three years before it came out, that killed any investment in Ultralink. And Ultralink went down to to sort of bare bones and they were, they stayed alive but they weren't active. And they were taken over by another company who thought this is definitely a market. This is the most accurate imaging machine in the whole of medicine and we want to build it. So 
The Visanti kind of put a bit of a, some sand in the engine because they said that the anterior chamber, yeah, we can do all of that. We'll do at least 50% of the intrastromal measurements and, well, we can't do epithelium, but we will in the future. And we don't need the posterior chamber. And this is what came out with the Visanti. You can see the signal here at the front of the cornea and you look at the difference in signal to noise ratio with ultrasound. It's, it's, it's chalk and cheese. And that's why the measurements, of course, weren't that accurate. We hear the studies showing that the accuracy of measurement was, was very poor for flap thickness with the Visante compared to introp um, uh, measurements with a, with a handheld. So despite the future claimed by uh, the OCT company, which of course tactically killed the development of, 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 of the ultrasound machine, and the promise of no, no rain, no water, every, you know, the water bath and everything, it just all seemed like hopeless. But we carried on because um, uh, th even though they promised that the angled measurement would take care of the ICL sizing and therefore make it unnecessary to measure behind the iris, we plotted on. And we, in those next 10 years, we published over 40 papers on application of epithelial thickness measurements in corneal surgery uh, and, and a few on ICLs, which I will talk about tomorrow. So finally, in 2012, RTView, seeing an opportunity in the market, made epithelial maps, and they made six millimeter maps with, uh, which David Huang published uh, in, in, in sort of duplicating our work, and many other groups started duplicating our work and validating what we've been saying about keratoconus screening. And now you can buy, well, pretty much any OCT that's going to do anterior segment is going to do epithelium. They're all doing it now. In fact, Zeiss is about to do it as well. And so we, in our clinic, it's great. We have three OCTs. We have three OCTs in three testing rooms because we get an epithelial map on every single patient. We want to be able to see straight away if immediately if a topography like this is instantly explained by thicker epithelium. There's no need to go any further. That's it. This guy gets LASIK. No problem. The accuracy of OCT centrally is quite good, the difference between the two, but it gets quite a little bit worse, especially inferiorly at the three millimeter zone, and beyond the three millimeter zone, of course, it's much less accurate. And that is important because it is only very small differences in epithelium that cause this donut shape that's, that's hiding the cone from the surface topography. So even little bits matter. Here's an example of a case where the topography and tomography were all eh, okay, not too bad. The epithelial map with the OCT was not too bad, and we could have easily done surgery on this patient, but when we did the insight test, we found that the classifier was for keratoconus, and we do about 10% of our patients go to the ultrasound having had the three screens. And so we, we prove that in these equivocal cases, 1.6% of the case size, it's a good thing we didn't do the surgery. Good thing we didn't do the surgery. And we do about 100 patients a, year, a month, so that's one patient a month that we, we think we're not, we're not doing. But the good thing, of course, is that we're gaining 7% of patients who we would have had to say, I'm sorry, but it's too much risk to do your surgery with this on your record. And so it actually ends up a, quite a positive for us. Now, you know, the actual state of OCT, of course, is that the measurements are not quite as accurate. I mean, this is one pixel movement. As you can see, about eight or nine microns per pixel compared to the one micron mapping precision uh, with ultrasound. And we do use it. We use it hot. If someone's just peeled off a Visiomax during a, Visio during a smile treatment, no problem. We take them outside, we measure the depth, we plan a flap, we carry on, everything's fine. So we do use OCT all the time but we miss out the posterior chamber. And this is where the insight will really add to everything. And of course, it's FDA approved, CE marked. The water bath has been much improved. I won't play this video in full, but what I'm trying to show here is that in two minutes, the patient quite comfortably comes into the eye seal, and you'll see that the eye seal coupling is about 10 seconds, 35 seconds to adjust the head, about 15 seconds to just fill the water, about 30 seconds to get the ranging, then do the scanning, and then the patient comes off, and that's it. So it really is a, a two-minute exam, and I don't do these anymore. I did all of the Artemis exams, but the insight is all done by my technicians. And of course, the bad reputation of high-frequency ultrasound came from the what, lower resolution devices. And you can see that the prototype that I had was way better than the others, and the insight, of course, is even better than that. So now, I'm gonna to talk tomorrow about ICL sizing, but let's talk about the posterior chamber and the dark side of the moon, because we're now able to measure the volume of the lens and determine all of these planes. 
So the possibility now of being able to really investigate and use predictive ELP, elephant in the room, we may be able to take care of this problem. And finally, for the Americans in the audience, there is a glaucoma CPT code for immersion scanning. And if you um, look at Guy Kazarian's analysis of this, if you are an average glaucoma practice, you stand to earn gross profit of $10,000 a month just from billing the scanning of your uh, stents that you're putting in. But for me, the, 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 the thing that is the practice builder and the practice savior for me is being able to get accurate and confident diagnoses in a case where I don't understand what's happening. So a cornea that is, looks wrong, something's wrong with the cornea, and then I scan it and I know what's wrong with the cornea. Or a case where a lens is tilted or something is not right with the lens and I scan and I know what's happening. So it's the diagnosis which lets me sleep at night when I have a patient that could tear down my, my, my emotional state that month. Thank you very much. I don't know why else anyone else would have it. I mean, with what this device offers, which is so comprehensive and so accurate, do you think the key issue is just in the timing, really? If you go to the state where it is now, 10 years earlier, it would be a different landscape. I think that would have made a big difference to the, the size of the market for this machine because in 2000, um, there was no alternative for anything. Um, but I still think, as you can see from the way I've tried to present this in terms of Venn diagrams, I think that if you are a high-end provider who takes time with his patients and does get referrals from other surgeons for more complicated cases, who does higher ranges of correction, who is able to just squeeze things into safe margins in a way that wouldn't be done by someone who's just churning through cases. If you're someone who manages his own complications in-house and doesn't just refer out and carry on you know, the, the money mill, um, I think that it, I, I don't see how you could suffer from spending 60,000 euros for this device because it's, it completely is additive to the way that I practice. And I, and I say, I mean, it, when I had the Artemis One, it used to go down every, I don't know, eight months, 16 months, and I had an engineer who'd come in and take it on the floor for three months, and we, go, we would go nuts because we didn't have access to this technology. So, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, 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 all I can say is, you know, for people like you who are literally world-leading eye surgeons doing all kinds of acrobatics in the anterior chamber and, 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 and in LASIK, um, I, I can't imagine why you wouldn't say, wow, I, I can't believe I didn't get this sooner. So what is the user base for the overall worldwide? It's very small. The company got FDA and CE approval last year. So they're just at the beginning. It's a startup. It's a small startup. The funding, as you know, in the last five years for any technologies, especially diagnostics, especially in ophthalmology, has been, you know, non, there's no interest. So the company is struggling, I would say, uh, to be honest, and I think it would be just such a shame that they've gone and developed a six degrees of freedom scanner with one micron precision for the anterior segment that gives us information behind the iris and in front that can be married with an incredible technology, as we saw this morning, the, the CR39 from CSO, simultaneous epithelium, back surface with OCT, and then the posterior chamber information. It's literally, it's everything you need to know about the anterior segment between those two technologies and, you know, IOL calculations and complication management is basically revolutionized. Uh, and it's not $500,000, it's 60,000 euros. Thank you again for this very convincing talk. Can you tell us something about the maintenance of this machine before we get out of Okay, very good. Well, um, I, I had mine, uh, I got one of the first ones, thank God, uh, boy did I pay for it. Um, we had one incidence of service that we had to call the company for, which was the machine overheating, and within two weeks they had identified what happened, and then they, it was to do with a software thing, so they changed the piece of software, and to be honest, since last August, it, it has been working nonstop in our clinic. We have not had an issue. I mean, I know uh, um, um, Oliver Findel had a machine installed a few months ago. Of course, he has 
uh, he's in a hospital that's a teaching hospital, so they're going through like months and months of paperwork to try and get it into a clinical trial. Uh, but the few times they've used it, they've had some issues, and it turns out that there was a there was a cable from the transducer that was faulty. So there, there can be little things going on, but in my experience, it's been unbelievably robust. I mean, when I sit down to do a scan, it literally takes me under two minutes to get an, an eye scan. And, and, I, and when I have a complex case that comes to me from another country to see me, I, I do them the, the honor of actually doing the scan myself. Um, and it's, I mean, I, I can't believe I'm already finished. I'm like, oh, that was it, <laughs> all right. Um, I, know, I, I gotta say, you know, I mean, I mean Shiraz, Julian, the way that you guys practice, all of you guys here, uh, it, 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 I don't know. If, if the company had the ability to produce machines and drop them into your clinics, I guarantee you within six months you'd be like, I would have paid double for that if I'd known. Uh, but they don't have that kind of money. It's a startup. And I just hope, I just hope that, that the, the, the messaging and, you know, the 130 peer-reviewed publications that we have so far on it, there aren't that many technologies that come on the market with over 100 papers already published on it. Uh, I've never seen one, have you? Uh, this is really the first, I've, I've had the, the sort of free runway with no one interested for 15 years. I was, I was, academically, it's been a gift, but, <laughs> but uh, I really hope that uh, other people can benefit from this one day. And just being a devil's advocate, okay, from a state-of-the-art OCT with epithelial mapping, yeah. <clears throat> as you showed, it only takes a few seconds for you to do that mapping. You do that, that's easy, you can do that first. What additional information for the cornea would, you, would I get from performing a full, full scan? So, what we find is that the epithelium from OCT is quite accurate in the center of the cornea, but less and less accurate as we go out towards the periphery. So it, 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 it's, it's, out of a, it's out by about two microns at the three millimeter zone and sub, sub, subsequently further and further out. The cones that we're trying to identify might have two or three microns difference in that little donut pattern that you're looking at. And so we can't identify them with OCT in about 10% of cases. And when you think about it, it sounds like not very much, but when, it's, when you're doing 100 patients a month, and 10% of the cases you're uncomfortable with about whether you should do it or not, and you can actually do an, an ultrasound scan, and most of them go through to surgery, that's actually, you know, for maybe not where patients are coming to from the yin-yang with three-year waiting list, but if you are, 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 are relying on every patient coming through the door uh, becoming an appropriate surgical candidate, then this really pays off, Julian. And, you know, it's not just the overlap, because I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I use OCT. I have three OCTs in my clinic because I use it all the time. But I use the ultrasound for catch-up on the cornea and, of course, for ICL sizing. And I hope it will be uh, you guys getting it into the ELP realm. So that's not the only advantage that I can see. I mean, I another uh, ultrasound device that I use to do this, uh, this measurement. And actually, I don't understand that that often anymore. Um, that would be the advantage of an OCT. And, yeah, and there's, there's, there's the clinical cases as well. And being able to scan a flap 10 years after surgery, which on, on an OCT you, you just can't. You, know? I mean, you, know, you can make a, maybe find one little piece of dust in the interface sometimes. But it's, it just gives you that confident measurement. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, it's actually, ultrasound is very simple technology. It's, 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 it's so simple in terms of what's inside the box. There isn't that much that can break, if you see what I mean. It's just ultrasound. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much,